Hello and welcome to the second video accompanying lecture 25 where we're talking about the background and key ideas of atomic physics. In the first video I introduced early models of the atom including the Bohr model and discussed how the Bohr model used a little bit of modern quantum mechanics and the idea of the de Broglie wavelength. Now we're going to continue to modify the Bohr model. This video is going to focus on, as I said before, ad hoc additions to the Bohr model that included more of quantum mechanics. And again, ad hoc just means kind of as you go additions, right? Just finding what worked and going on with it. Okay, so one of the first great achievements of quantum mechanics was the solution of the wave equation for the hydrogen atom. Although the details of the solution are beyond the level of this course, this course, let's take a look at the implications of that solution. So, so according to quantum mechanics, the energies of the allowed states in the, um, are in exact agreement with the values obtained by, Bohr, by the Bohr theory, when the allowed energies depend only on the principal quantum number n. In addition to the principal quantum number, so before we just called that the quantum number, now notice that we're calling n the principal quantum number. Names are important here. So in addition, Two other quantum numbers emerge from the solution to the Schrodinger's wave equation. This is a differential equation, and um, the, one of the solutions in a 3D sense gave us our model, remember 3D, gave us our model for the Bohr model. So the orbital quantum number is called L, and the orbital magnetic quantum number is called M sub L. Okay, so these are the new, new values of quantum numbers. So we can observe the effect of the magnetic quantum number m sub l in spectra by placing the sample in a magnetic field. The result is that the individual spectral, spectral lines, like those seen in the Balmer series or the Lyman series, are split into several lines. So each one line becomes multiple lines. This splitting is called the Zeeman effect. So that's a splitting of the energy levels due to the presence of an external magnetic field. The figure shows a single spectral line being split into three closely spaced lines. This indicates the, the energy of an electron is slightly modified when the atom is immersed in a magnetic field. The allowed ranges of the values of these quantum numbers are as follow, follows. And again, these are just going to be things you have to memorize. We're not going to show these solutions because it's a rather complex three-dimensional differential equation, a second order partial differential equation that gives us this. You know, it's, it is a, it's a years of study in and of itself. The allowed ranges of the values of these quantum numbers, right? As I said, well, n can range from one to infinity, right? So you can have, you know, those, those are like the orbital the, or the principal quantum numbers and they do refer to orbits in this, this kind of this visualization we have, okay? Ground state is n of one. The um, values of the orbital quantum number so this is variations on each energy level, can range from 0 to n minus 1. All right? You can see that's, that's pointed out here, right? So minimum of 0. So that means that in the ground state, when n is 1, the orbital quantum number can be what? Well, it could only be 0. It can range from 0 to 0, right? 1 minus 1 is 0. So there's only a single value that exists, okay? Furthermore, the magnetic quantum numbers can range from negative L to L. So again, for an N of 1, that would be from negative 0 to 0. Okay, so you can see in that case of N of 1, there's just a single state, even when we, even when we include these, these effects of the orbital number and the magnetic number. Okay, and again, the magnetic quantum number is aptly named because we can actually see a splitting of the energy levels in the presence of an external magnetic field, which is where the discovery of the, the magnetic quantum number came from. Um, another thing to consider is that these splittings are very small. If you think of this as delta lambda, it's a much, much smaller difference than the difference between principal quantum numbers wavelengths. Okay? All right. So again, maybe something you've seen before, but make sure that you remember those rules and of course have them written down. Okay? I'll include them in the formula sheet. Um, but you may be referring to your own, your own documents when you take your at-home exam. All right, so to take a look at the next, uh, next page. All right, so this is just summarizing more of the rules. All right, so from these rules, we can see that for a given value of n, the principal quantum number, there are n possible values of L, okay? Wh um, where, whereas for a given value of L, there are 2L plus 1 possi possible values of ML. Right, so there's definitely definitely a neat kind of uh, counting rule that we can um, see, and make sure that you understand that it's not terribly complex, but it's kind of interesting, right? So 
any number of end states, right? They become really closely packed together. So in practicality, there's, you know, we wouldn't really distinguish more than 50 or something, but fundamentally there's any number of values that N can take on, um, but then there can be N values of L for a particular value of N. So like on the fifth N of five, there's five values of L and so on. And then there's even more values of the magnetic quantum number M sub L, okay? So that, you know, so there starts being quite a few variations, right? So you can, the number of possible states in the higher orbits becomes quite a bit larger than in the lower orbits, okay? All right, so for historical reasons, all states with the same principal quantum number n are said to form a shell, okay? So again, this is kind of thinking about the idea that these allowed orbits um, are like tracks, and so maybe they, they kind of form this resonating shell. In reality, it's just a probability cloud, um, but we refer to them as shells, okay? And you could think of these as like nesting shells, like one, one quantum state within another, right? You could peel it away, like layers of an onion. So shells are identified by the letters K, L, M, et cetera, okay? Again, the, naming, the letter names don't make much sense. They're just historical baggage, okay? So, um, so we can say that states with a given value of N and L form a subshell, right? So that every value of L is called a subshell, this terminology here. Um, the letters S, P, D, F, G, and so on are used to designate the states of L equals zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. So these notations are summarized in the lower table, okay? So this is, this is the naming, okay? So shell symbols, one, two, three, four, five, six, correspond to the letters K, L, M, N, O, P, and then for L's, L of zero, one, uh, one two, three, four, five, correspond to S, P, D, F, G, H, okay? Just names to remember. Uh, I'll use the numbers, but I'll, the letters will also come up. So we might talk about the, um, you know, I guess um, the, what's, what's one that comes, I mean, a lot of, I'd say the, the le these letters don't get used very frequency, I, frequently. I don't talk about the K, S state, but one thing that you'll see a lot in physics is the one S state or the 2p state. So more often you see the n referred to by numbers, but the subshells referred to by letter. Just, just the way that it's really kind of represented that in this you know, particular era, right? Let notation changes over time, certainly would be different in different countries and so on. Even though the general idea is international, just kind of the little idiosync idiosyncrasies like 1s and 2p, I think are specific to America. Okay, all right, so just to make, make sure you get a handle on that. All right, let's do an example. So when the principal quantum number is N of five, how many different values of L are possible? Right, make sure you feel confident about your answer. Okay, it is of course five. So answer, answer two is correct. All right, because it's, there's N possible values of L for a particular state. So in N equals five, there'd be five possible values of L. All right. So for n equals five, how many different values of the magnetic quantum number m sub l are possible? All right, so that should be, make sure you, make sure you know it. Yep, nine, because it's two n minus one. Okay, all right, last one here. So in the principal quantum number n equals five, how many states have distinct pairs, val pairs of values l and m sub l? All right, so now we need to pair them up in a distinct way. Okay, so this one, it's really a matter of kind of counting them out and thinking about the ones that are distinct. So think about it. Maybe you can quickly come up with an answer. So this is the way that um, I would think of it, right? So we know that um, L can be one, two, three, four, and five. And then that's going to correspond to ML values. Well, here we could have negative one and one. Here we have negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. Here, negative three negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, four, okay? And then you can, so then we think about, okay, so then for, you know, for this one, so see, so here we had, so how many different values of MLs? Yeah, so then here we have, so we, here we have different combinations, right? So this this is where we have the two, this would be the two, two n minus one. So here that we know that there's nine, okay? And so then we would just, we just sum them up, right? So this one here would give us one, two, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Wait, that one gave us nine. Um, hmm. 
So, I mean, those are just the number of distinct states. Let's see, but here we're going from, oh, that's right, there is no L of five. That's the problem, right? Because L can, L can only be up to um, N minus one. That, that was like, it's like, that's not working out. Yeah, because N, um, L varies between, um, of course, as we saw before, it varies between zero and N minus one. So the biggest one we have is four. Okay, so that, that's why nine, nine is the final, the final kind of combination Right? So if we then we count up, so in other words, when you're in the L state, you could have a magnetic quantum number of negative four. So you could have, you could have a, a case that would be N equals five, just to make sure we're all clear on this, L equals four, M sub L equals negative four. But you could also have negative three and so on, right? So those would all be distinct states. So then we just count them up. So we have nine for this row. In this row, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, so we got seven here, nine here. This one, it looks like we have five. All right, and then here we have two, so then we just sum those all up. So seven plus seven is 14, 14 plus nine is 25. So there are 25 distinct combinations of L and M sub L in the principal quantum number N state. All right, good. Okay, so another thing we haven't talked about in addition from quantum mechanics is the idea of spin, okay? So this is a, a further refinement. So if we use high resolution spectrometers to look at one of the prominent lines of sodium vapor, we see that this line is in fact two very, very closely spaced lines. The wavelength of these lines are at wavelengths of 589 nanometers and 509.6 nanometers, a yellow color. This kind of splitting is referred to as fine structure. Okay, so it's fine structure splitting. This discovery of fine structure splitting led to the discovery of spin. So in 1925, when, when this doublet, as it's called, all right, so, you know, doublet, we'll talk, see, it comes in a pair, we'll talk about that. Atomic theory couldn't explain it. So Samuel um, Goldsmith and George Uhlenbeck, following a suggestion by Austrian physicist Wolfgang Pauli, okay, um, Pauli's a name that comes up in modern physics quite a bit, proposed the introduction of a fourth quantum number, this is our fourth and final quantum number, number by the way, to describe atomic energy levels, M sub S, this is called the spin quantum number. All right, spin isn't found in the solution of the Schrodinger's equation. It naturally arises in the Dirac equation derived in 1907 by Paul Dirac. This equation is important in relativistic quantum theory. So that's it. What is the Dirac equation, right? Now, at least, you know, now with, you know, hindsight of, you know, almost 100 years looking back at this stuff, we see that the Dirac equation is really the, the special relativistic correction to the um, uh, the Schrodinger's equation. Because Schrodinger's equation, despite its complexity and, and amazing explanation of models like the hydrogen atom through a wave equation, a matter wave equation for the electron, did not account for special relativity. And although these electrons are still are moving at you know 1% of the speed of light or less, when you do account for special relativity, then you come up with the idea of spin. Okay. Now again, it's not literally spin because you could think of it as angular momentum, like a planet that's either spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. But that is a helpful visualization of what it represents. Because if we're kind of continuing this analogy, this tortured analogy of thinking of electrons as planets orbiting uh, the nucleus, like this, like a like a star or a sun, then we can think of spin as the rotation, like the rotation that causes the day on Earth. Okay. So in describing the spin quantum number, it's convenient but technically incorrect. You have to think of the electron as spinning on its own axis. If the direction of spin is as shown in the figure, all right, then the electron is said to have spin up. Right? So if the direction is counterclockwise, um, if it's spinning the other way, then it's thought to have spin down. The energy of the electron is slightly different for the two spin directions. And this energy difference accounts for the sodium doublet, okay? There's that split um, emission line. When the quantum numbers associated with electron spin are m sub s equals one half for spin up and m sub s equals negative one half for spin down. All right, so m sub s can equal plus or minus one half. So, you know, we've been using all these integers for our counting tools here. Well, it turns out that spin is a half integer, the only one, okay? And so for each electron, there are two spin states. A subshell sub sub corresponding to the given factor of L can contain no more than two times two L plus one states. All right, so this number is used because electrons in a subshell must have unique pairs of quantum numbers, okay? So every electron in a subshell, and that's an L number, 
must have a unique combination of ms and ml. All right, so you can't have two spin up electrons that have the same magnetic number, just like you can't have two electrons that have the same mag um, magnetic number and the same spin number. All right, so, all right, so for example, in the L, for, in the P shell of L equals one, we would have two times two L plus one possible electrons, okay? So we'd have, um, and that's because if we think of the P shell, let's take a look at this, so the, oh, went back too far. So the P shell um, corresponds to an L of one, all right? And so, yep, uh, yep, L of one, as stated. Okay, just wanna make sure, check, I was questioning myself. And so then we just, uh, yeah, so then we just plug in an L of one, and then we get the number of electrons that can exist in that particular shell, six electrons, all right? Because every, every you can think of it this way, like every combination of M, of N, L, and M sub L has two electrons that fit there because there can be one spin up electron and one spin down electron in that combination of quantum numbers, okay? All right. And this idea that every, every electron has to have unique, a unique combination of quantum numbers, including its spin number, is called the Pauli exclusion principle, all right? Named after you know, this, um, these discoveries. All right, so that is our final quantum number, the spin quantum number. So I mentioned this idea of the electron probability cloud. So the solution of the wave equation, that, that is the um, Schrodinger's um, wave, um, basically the differential equation called Schrodinger's equation has wave functions, which are solutions to that differential equation, because of course functions are solutions. And those wave functions are called, are represented by the letter psi. All right, that's the Greek letter psi. And psi depends on the quantum numbers n, l, and m sub l. Recall that if p is a point um, and vp is a very small volume according to, uh, uh, corresponding to that point, then psi squared times vp is approximately the probability of finding an electron inside that volume p. Okay, because here we have probability graphed against location. And so this is just, so then the most probable location of finding an electron is there. So the probability has this maximum value corresponding to the Bohr radius, but it's possible to find the electron at other locations. Think Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Its location can't be exactly known because it's a wave after all. And so here we have this idea that what type of wave is it? It's a matter wave, but it turns out that it's also useful to think of that matter wave as a probabilistic wave. This sort of the, the solutions to the wave function are probability functions, all right? So the figure on the left gives the probability per unit length of finding an electron, as I spoke about. As you can see um, by the curve, there is probability of finding the electron other than exactly at the radius um, given by the Bohr model. Quantum mechanics predicts that the wave function for the hydrogen atom in the ground state is spherically symmetric. This means the electron can be found in a spherically, spherical region surrounding the nucleus with an um, you know, equal decreasing probability as we get closer um, closer in than the Bohr radius, and an equal um, decreasing probability as we get further out from the Bohr radius, symmetrically, radially symmetric. Of course, the probability falls off in a different, different way on the different sides, but still it's, it would be um, symmetric about the origin where the nucleus would be, right, where you'd find the proton. Um, if similar analysis is carried out for other states, then other shape probability clouds arise, all right? So they're not all spherically symmetric. They, they take on quite a few complicated shapes. This, the solution that suggests those shapes being well beyond the course, okay? But maybe you've seen these ones that look like dumbbells or kind of, you know, like dumbbells with ringlets around them. Those all come out of solutions to Schrodinger's equation, those solutions being probabilistic wave functions. All right, so let's summarize the Pauli um, exclusion principle. No two electrons in an atom can ever have the same set of values for a set of quantum numbers n, l, m sub l, and m sub s. So principal quantum number, orbital quantum number, magnetic orbital, often, often just called the uh, magnetic quantum number, and finally the spin quantum number. Okay, those are the four. Every electron has a unique combination of those. And that tells you how many electrons it takes to fill shells and subshells, of course, right? Okay. So here we have a summary of filling the shells, right? So in the K shell, there is only a single subshell. 
that single subshell can be filled with two electrons, um, not because they have different magnetic numbers or anything, but because one can be spin up and one can be spin down, so they can have different spin quantum numbers. So that shell is filled with a, a total of two electrons, right? That's, you know, that's the idea, that that first shell fills up with two. The next shell, the L shell, corresponding to a principal quantum number of two, can have different values of L, it can have zero and one, corresponding to S and P subshell names. The S shell holds two electrons based on, in this case, just spin numbers, but the P subshell can hold up to six electrons because it can have varying magnetic quantum numbers, and each of those varying magnetic quantum numbers can also have two spin quantum numbers that fit inside of it. So we end up with six that are held in the P shell. So in summary, then, the L shell holds eight, all right? The M shell has subshells P, D, um, or S, P, and T, all right? And S, P, and D are filled by two, six. These subshells always fill the same, right? The D subshell fills up with 10. That means the entire shell of M holds 18. And finally, N, right? N has four possible subshells, S, P, D, and F, which hold two, six, 10, and 14 electrons, respectively, because of combinations of magnetic and spin quantum numbers, for a grand total in the N shell of 32 electrons. Okay? So that's how electrons fill up shells based on solutions to the Schrodinger wave equation, thinking of electrons as matter waves, and then taking into account their relativistic behavior with the Dirac equation. All right? So this leads to big tables of energy levels and known symbols for elements, because it turns out that a element that has a particular number of electrons defines an element, right? That leads to the idea of the periodic table. All right, so historically, then we get the periodic table. In 1871, a Russian chemist named Dmitry Medlev, Medlev, excuse me, um, who lived um, from 1834 to 1907, um, arranged the elements known at that time into a table according to the atomic masses and chemical similarities. All right, so within 20 years of uh, the announcement of this table, the missing spots that he had claimed must just be undiscovered elements indeed turned out to be undiscovered elements that were discovered. So his assumption was brought you know, into validity. And now we know that the periodic table can be, can be further viewed through the context of quantum mechanics because all of those energy states, all of those numbers of electrons and similar chemical behavior has to follow the idea that those electrons are resonating matter waves. All right? Okay, well, thank you for watching this video as well. Just some uh, periodic table um, information here. And please check out the third and final video where I'm briefly going to um, touch on the final two topics of this chapter, which is the idea of characteristic x-rays for larger atoms and how lasers work briefly. All right, so thanks again for watching.